Luke chapter number 2, Luke chapter number 2 this morning, I want to share a message with you this morning about the mighty hand of God. This is a wonderful resource that we Christians have available to us, the mighty hand of God, and I think without a doubt, probably one of the most misused or underused things that we could probably have available to us as Christians is the power that God freely stands uh, ready to give us uh, whenever we ask. You know, being a Christian affords us with a lot of privileges that the lost world does not have. Because we're a child of the King of Kings, uh, we have some things available to us that uh, most folks only hope for. And oftentimes we Christians, uh, we never take advantage fully of those things that are available to us. Uh, you know, 21st century Christians are a proud group. Many times because uh, they often keep their problems and all their trials to themselves. They don't share them with anybody. They don't ask for prayers. They just try to sort of trudge through life on their own and try to handle their struggles on their own. And I'm here to tell you this morning, if that's the way that you're conducting yourself in your Christian life, you're in for some bad days. Amen. Some of you may be carrying burdens this morning. Burdens that may have been with you for a long period of time. I mean, I don't know uh, only what folks have shared, but in a group like this, most Sundays, there's folks who come in with burdens. And we have, uh, a lot of times, things that are causing us great distress in our life. And maybe a a wayward child, maybe a, a financial burden, maybe a relationship that is not all that it could be, and it's been that way for a long time, and, and maybe a health problem. Maybe you're here this morning and you have a health problem that is serious and is causing you great concern this morning, but, uh, you know, we have a, a need maybe for God to fix something in our life this morning that only He can do. And the truth is, if we think about it long enough, we probably have come to a place in our mind, either knowingly or subconsciously, where we've made a decision about it, and we've said it's just the way it is. Not going to change. God's not going to fix it. It's just the way it is. It's this way because it's just this way. And you've come to a place where you're kind of feeling even maybe a little bit hopeless about that situation in your life this morning. But can I tell you, whatever you're facing... This morning, the Bible makes it very clear that God's hand is mighty. The Bible also makes it clear that God's decisions are sovereign. Uh, because God's hand is, mi is mighty, He has no shortage of power, unlike us. Uh, because God is sovereign, He makes no mistakes. His timing is perfect. He never gets to the point of finishing something that he wills to do only to come to a place and say, ah, oh, I made a mistake. Or he never comes to a place where he says, I've got the wrong person. Or he never comes to a place where he says, I'm, I'm just out of gas. I don't have any more to do. I can't give anymore. That's not the God we serve. We serve a God that is all-powerful, almighty. He's... He's uh, all sovereign. He does things according to His own will. And, and what we need to do is just simply this morning trust Him uh, for what He has to do in our life. You know, those of us remember uh, that are here this morning remember growing up in Vermont on cold winter mornings when the car battery just did not have enough power to turn the engine over. Has that ever happened to you? Or you've gone outside with great expectations, expecting to go someplace to do something, only to get in the car and turn the ignition, and you hear that, Whoa. Whoa. and it just won't go. Uh, what does that mean? Normally we have to call for, what, a jump start, don't we? Realizing the only way to get moving again was to summon a power from outside of ourselves, and certainly knowing that you're not going anywhere without a boost. Sometimes in our Christian life, that's where we get we get to a place where we're just ourselves are just out of gas. We have no more to give. We feel like we've done all we can. And we're just at the place where we are. And we just have to realize that's where we're going to be. And oftentimes we get hopeless. We feel hopeless. 
But that's what also happens to Christians who try to go through life themselves. Never coming to a full understanding of the value of God's power in our life. As Christians this morning, we need God's hand on our life. We cannot function the way we should in this world without God's power, without His hand on our life, without His hand of blessing, without His grace. Reaching a place of hopelessness, we realize oftentimes that we're stranded. But we do not have to stay in that place. Because we serve a God who says clearly, ask me and I'll deliver. Uh, Ask yourselves the question this morning, over and over. How many times have you asked this question? Can anything, can this situation get any worse? Sometimes we're in a place and, and it seems like we get to the rock bottom place and we think, oh, okay, we're finally at the bottom. Now we can maybe start thinking about going up. And then all of a sudden, more gets dumped on. And you say to yourself, can things get any worse? Maybe a financial crisis that you're facing and you just get one thing taken care of and you figure out how God's going to work and provide something and then all of a sudden some other big expense comes your way. Could this get any worse? Because God is sovereign, He has authority to do whatever He chooses in our life. He doesn't need to ask our permission. Uh, He doesn't need to to come to us ahead of time and say, hey, I'm getting ready to send you into a trial. Would Tuesday at 6 be okay? He just does what He pleases. And we need to understand that He always has our best interest at heart. No matter what we face, God always has our best interest at heart. And He has the ability to rescue us from a hopeless situation. Many times, He's the only one who can. When things appear to the mortal man to be at an end, God specializes in bringing to pass the impossible. And He specializes in doing the unexplained. When we think everything is done and nothing can affect our situation, God moves in and changes the outcome. Let me give you an example this morning of a Bible story that I feel like fits this principle very well. It's found in Luke chapter 2. You're in Luke chapter 2. Look, if you will, at verse number 1. The Bible says, It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Now here's the, in the scripture, we find this story of a newlywed couple, a young lady named Mary and her husband Joseph. We know the story. We read it every Christmas. Still young enough not to have learned many hard lessons in life as a married couple because they're newly married. Haven't really experienced much of life as a married couple. Joseph has taken Mary for his bride. And those of us know the story behind the young couple. We know how they came together under tough public circumstances. Before being officially married, uh, Mary was found to be with child. And remember, that was a stoning offense in that day. Most folks would not understand that situation at all. It's not like today. Back in that day, it was a serious thing. But yet Mary makes a decision, in spite of the public scrutiny that she was under, she makes a decision to trust God. Joseph, also her husband, he struggles mightily with this situation and finally overcomes his emotions and accepts Mary's explanation after his own visitation from God confirms her story. But this young couple, I'll tell you, is in a tough spot. Uh, Say nothing about being sent to be taxed. This couple, just in and of the the circumstances that they're in, is in a tough place. And we, we see that in the scriptures that we just read here. But now we come back to Luke chapter number 2, and we see in there in verse 1 where the Bible says... And it came to pass in those days. You know, sometimes in our Christian life, when we're in a struggle, 
Sometimes we feel like the last thing we need is for something else to come to pass. But here they are, they're in that place, and the Bible says it comes to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now Caesar Augustus was the second in the line of Caesars. He ruled from 31 B.C. until 14 A.D. Uh, for about a short period of time, but 14 or 15 years there, and he was the longest reigning of the Caesars. Now during his reign, we see God using this pagan emperor to usher in the Messiah. How did he use him? He In Luke chapter 2, verse 1, we see the decree. He sends out a decree, and he says that all the world should be taxed. And you think about it just on the surface. You say, oh, geez, it's a, just another government putting more taxes on the people who are probably already overtaxed, like we are here in this country. But here it is again, the... The, the, the man who's in charge sends out a decree, I want all the people to come and pay their taxes. And God uses this pagan emperor to move the entire known world into action to simply fulfill his prophecy. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrath, that thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. That is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. Luke chapter 2 and verse 1 is a prophecy fulfilled of Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. And here we find the fulfillment of this prophecy. God had to move Mary and Joseph to action. And he chose Caesar Augustus' decree to do that work. He chose to use this pagan emperor in the decree to do it. You see, he needed to get Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. And can I say this morning that no man in his right mind would, under normal circumstances, take his very pregnant wife, place her on the back of a donkey, and head out of such a long journey that would surely be troublesome and very difficult. Uh, I believe they were a couple that had really next to nothing as far as resources. But that, here the Lord steps in and says, you've got to go to Bethlehem to pay your taxes. Can you imagine what must have been going through this young couple's mind? Joseph probably in the, the shadows of the day probably said, are you got to be kidding me? Now? I don't know, it's just my mind's eye at seeing that, but... I'm sure Joseph is just a man like we are and probably struggles with some of the same things we do. But Joseph was not just any man. Joseph had made a decision to respect God's authority. And when God moved Caesar Augustus to issue his decree, Joseph took the leadership and respected the authorities God had placed in his life. I'm probably sure that Joseph was not in love with paying taxes. I'm sure that when the decree came out and he was made aware of it, he didn't jump for joy and say, yay, we get to pay more taxes, amen. <laughs> Is there anybody here that does that? No, I didn't think so. But most people I know are not like that about taxes. We don't mind paying our fair share, but we don't want to pay what we don't owe, certainly. But, but he was willing instead to be obedient. And God's sovereignty was behind Joseph's actions. Now probably Joseph, if asked, would have said it's the law for me to go to Bethlehem and pay my taxes that I owe or else I'll face certain jail or legal consequences. I don't know, but he must have had that discussion at some point in his mind because whatever the reason, he decided he was going to follow the instruction. He was going to do what was being asked. Now I want you to think about this for a second. God could have done anything that he had chosen to do to bring Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem so that the Lord could be born there. But instead he used a worldly leader to move the whole world just to bring this young couple to the place where the Savior would be born. And I bring that to your attention this morning because many times in our Christian life, 
we don't think about God's ability that way. We think about God's ability oftentimes and we put God in a little box. And we say to ourselves things like, well, this is going on and it's been going on and there's nothing I can do and we're just where we are because it's just where we are and we made some dumb decisions and now we're here and we've just got to deal with it. And we never one time give God the ability to intervene. Never one time do we lift it up in prayer and say, Lord, I'm at a place in my life where I can't do anything else. I'm, I'm hopeless. I, there's nothing I can do that I haven't already done to try to make this situation better. I need to come to this place, Lord, where I just know that You're the only one that can affect the situation. God chose to move an entire world. You think He can handle your problem this morning? God wasn't concerned about everyone paying their taxes on time. Or probably even whether Joseph and Mary paid theirs. His plan for mankind was far greater than that. But when God is executing His sovereign will, He uses whatever and whomever He chooses. He may even use that person in your life that uh, you see as a menace. He may use a boss at work that you feel like you have no respect for. Maybe the boss has put some requirements on you that you just don't feel are justified. Have you ever thought that maybe God's at work? Seeing how we'll respond in the given situation. You know, as Americans, we honestly do not know when the government will come out with some new law that will affect us as Christians. We, we don't know. Uh, when you think about the, the, the folks in Washington, and, and most of them are ungodly and have no desire to do things God's way and uh, seem to have no courage to stand up in the face of some of the things that people are recommending, I, I can't even believe that I read the story yesterday about how they needed to get dad's permission to put that little child in custody with someone else. Did you all see that? The person who murdered that, way, that woman the police had to get his permission. The murderer's permission. According to state law, to put that child in custody to somebody who care for it. Don't you think for one second that this government that we have in front of us is always going to do what God wants? We never know when they might raise our taxes again. Or when they might set some policy to make it more difficult to practice our faith. But what I want you to understand this morning is that none of these things, none of these potential things that, that these folks in Washington could do or in Montpelier can do uh, are going to take God by surprise. God's not sitting up there wringing His hands trying to figure out what to do next. If any of these things come to pass, they come with God's full knowledge. They never take Him by surprise. They are all part of the spiritual warfare that rages in our world every day. If you don't think that there's spiritual warfare raging in society on a daily basis, then you have your head in the sand. Good against evil. God against Satan. Everything that goes on in our government is as a result of a manifestation of His spiritual warfare raging behind the scenes. Caesar Augustus was the man in charge of the known world of that area and certainly of that day, and this was not by coincidence. It was God's design plan from the beginning. You know, the word Augustus is a Latin term for the word emperor, and Caesar was the family name. So in reality, he was Caesar the emperor. In Acts 25, we find the name Augustus again, but this is a different person. This is a place where he's speaking about uh, the Emperor Nero. Caesar Augustus' real name was Caius Octavius Capius. And he was the great-grandson of Julius Caesar's sister, which made Julius Caesar his uncle. And I tell you that because if you ask folks today about Caesar, who are they going to talk about? 
They're not going to talk about Caesar Augustus. Most are going to talk about Julius. You know, Julius reigned the shortest time, just about two years, before he was assassinated. And you don't hear much talk uh, uh, about... Uh, you hear a lot of talk about him, but you don't hear much talk about Caesar Augustus. But Caesar Augustus was in power when the Lord decided to bring the gospel message to mankind. Most folks, if you asked them today, would not have a clue who this person is. At the time of Christ's birth, there were several political groups that were operating in and around that area. They were also viewed as spiritual. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Zealots, the Herodians. The, es the Essenes were the ones who came out with the doctrine of celibacy for the priesthood. And this was their creation, which Paul rebuked in his letter to Timothy. And the Zealots were used by God to fulfill his prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem. It was the Zealots that began the rebellion against the Romans, which brought about the complete destruction of the city. Simon Zelotius, which means Simon the Zealot, was one of the first mentioned in that sect, and he's mentioned in the Word of God. What's the point? God uses whom He chooses. Many things in our history, many things in our society have been happening right under our noses, and they've been part of God's big plan to bring to pass uh, His program for the world. And most often as Christians, we sit and we're totally ignorant of what's going on around us. God uses whomever He chooses. You know, during the reign of Caesar Augustus, Jesus was crucified, Stephen was stoned, and Paul was converted. All under the reign of this one man. And today, most folks, like I said, don't even know who He is. Again, more evidence of God's mighty hand at work. His sovereignty being fulfilled right on schedule. And in His timing and in the lives of whom He had chosen. There were many Roman emperors during the time when our Bible was coming together. Many of them are mentioned in Scripture. Many of them are not. But I tell you this, God again used his mighty power and sovereignty to do what he chose to do. He used the power of, of his power and sovereignty in the life of John when he wrote the book of Revelation. Who would have thought sitting here today that God would take this man John and he would send him to the Isle of Patmos or allow him to be sent there and he would pen the final book of our Bible and the canon would be complete. The canon of scripture would be complete. An insignificant event probably of that day, but yet it's a, an event that we Christians hold near and dear. That we now can stand here this morning and, and have this Bible complete and, and perfect in its entirety and nothing missing, nothing left out that God wanted us to have. But God used many men to write this book. And those men not only wrote the book, but they were willing to be used of God. Do you think that those men had any struggles in life? you think Paul went through life and said, wow, this is just great. I'm on the good ship lollipop and I'm going to ride it all the way into heaven. No, I think Paul had some trials. And I think Paul had some struggles in life. I think John had some struggles. I think Peter certainly had struggles. And Timothy and some of the other folks that the Bible talks very, uh, very uh, uh, in great length about. But yet these men were, in spite of these things, were willing to be used of God. You know, God is never going to force any of us to do what we don't want to do. I think we take that for granted sometimes. But God never forces us to serve Him. Never forces us to worship Him. Never forces us to go any place that we don't want to go. But know this, he could if he wanted to. But he's instead given us the long-suffering hand of, of love and grace that we can choose out of love to serve him or not. 
But instead, oftentimes, what we do is we allow our problems to stand in the way of serving God. You know, this blessed book that would finally be complete after John wrote the book of Revelation, God's hand is mighty enough. If He can do those things, His hand is mighty enough for all of us to overcome anything that God allows in our life. You know, when I preach a message like this, I preach it sort of knowing full well that God could bring me this week something that I'm not expecting. And He can do the same for you. God's hand is mighty enough for all of us to overcome anything that comes our way. And when we claim this promise, we have to understand that anything means anything. He can take something from us that we love dearly. And He doesn't need to even need to ask us our permission. He can do it like that. The Bible makes it expressly clear if we continue to handle life situations the way that we have been, handling life situations that God brings our way, oftentimes we Christians are guilty of handling them just like unsafe people. Now if we're honest this morning, we've got to put our hand up. So yes, pastor, I know that I've had a situation in my life and I've been handling it like an unsafe person does. If we do that, we'll continue, by the way, to get the same results that we've always gotten. We'll struggle, we'll be stressful, we'll, 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 we'll uh, shed tears, we'll do this, we'll do that. But I'm telling you this morning, if you want God to step in and move and and you want to see His hand of power in your life, and you want to see Him bring to pass the things that only He can bring to pass, we've got to understand it has to be, has to be His way. Psalm 119.71 says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Sometimes we're afflicted because we just are not learning. Sometimes we get into a tough spot because we're just not listening to what God is trying to do. You know, God will always allow us to do whatever we want to do. Even if it means something that we're doing, He knows is not good for us. Now sometimes He'll throw up a roadblock and we'll be wise enough to see it and we'll change course, but oftentimes we, pr we charge right through. It's almost as if we're driving down a highway and there's a roadblock bridge out and we just charge through. And we don't even give God's providence a second thought. But God allows trials to strengthen us. Strengthen our faith in His mighty hand. Can I tell you, the problem is not God. It's us. We choose to ignore God's providence in our life, the opportunities that He allows to learn His statutes. If we choose to ignore these opportunities for growth that God allows in our life, the Bible calls us a fool. Psalm 38 verse 5 says, My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. Psalm 107.17, Fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's Proverbs 1 and verse 7. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Proverbs 12 and verse 15. And a wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but fool rageth and is confident. Proverbs 14, 16. Now we can trust in our own power and our own conceit all we want. And God will let us do it. Or we can begin this morning to start trusting in the only one that can move mountains on our behalf. Psalm 59 and verse 16 says, But I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense and my refuge in the day of my trouble. Psalm 65, verse 6, which, is by, which by his strength setteth fast the mountains, being girded 
with power. Psalm 71, verse 18. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to every one that is to come. How do we show this lost and dying world that we're a part of the power of God? How as Christians do we show this lost and dying world the mighty hand of God? Well, I'll tell you, it's not the way we do it normally. Trudging through life, defeated. Our countenances look like we've just swallowed a lemon. That's not the way we show the, the lost world the mighty hand of God. We show it through our own obedience. We show, that we, we show the lost world our own obedience and, and the respect of the same. We, we show them that we respect and we honor the Word of God. And can I tell you, when Christians exalt God over self, great things happen. When we put ourselves in the place where we belong, and that's not in first, great things can happen. When Christians are as concerned about offering God what we should be offering God as we are about offering it to ourselves, great things start happening. When we put ourselves in second place and let God have first place, then and only then will we experience the essence of God's mighty hand. God's hand is mighty this morning. And most of the time we never realize it. Because we never give Him the opportunity in our own life to fix things that only He can fix. We never say to Him, Lord, here I am. Look at me. Look at me in all the way that I'm doing things. Show me exactly where it is I'm wrong. Tell me, Lord, and rebuke me where I need rebuking. When we fall on our knees before God and we begin to send our prayers up towards heaven, do we say things like, Lord, I know I'm rotten and stinking and I know I just, I'm just i out of Your way. Search me, O God, and know my thoughts like David did. Our prayer life goes something like this. Lord, uh, could you get this, and could you do that, and could you fix this, and could you fix that, and just, you know, if it's not too much trouble, go ahead and, and square that away too. I'd really appreciate it. And if you've got an extra 50 bucks this week, I sure could use that too. See, that's not the way we should be praying as Christians. Until we see ourselves as God sees us, and start praying as God would have us see ourselves. And understanding that He can move a mountain on our behalf if we're willing and we're in the right place where we should be. And if we're, if we're uh, confessed up like we ought to be. And we've, we've put ourselves, laid ourselves open before God and we've given Him everything. He sees it anyway, by the way. We think that we're hiding things over on Him and we think that we're getting, getting by with... And we can get by with each other sometimes on certain things, but we cannot get by God. His, his, his eyes are just like uh, the old cartoon there, Superman. He's got x-ray vision. He can look right in there and see exactly what we're thinking, exactly what we're doing, exactly what we're planning to do. He knows all of that. And if we want to start experiencing God's mighty hand, we need to start realizing that there's a way that God prescribes for us in His Word to see that happen. And if we're willing to trust Him and we're willing to take Him at His Word and just let our burdens fall right there where they should at the throne of grace, I believe without a doubt we would see great things happen in our life. And we know this with confidence that whatever God allows, it's for our benefit. Sometimes God uses situations in our life to teach us a truth that we've been missing. Maybe God put something in your life this past week that He put there because He wants to bring attention to something in your life that you've missed. And just maybe it might be something that's not the right thing. God does what He wants to do with whoever He wants to do it. We need to understand this morning that He is sovereign, He's powerful. And only He can bring those things to pass that oftentimes we Christians need. We better start trusting Him the way the Bible tells us to.
Would you stand with me for prayer? Father, we come to you this morning. We ask your blessing upon the word as it's gone forth, Lord, on these verses of Scripture that we've read this morning. Lord, on the Proverbs and on the Psalms, Lord, the verses that we've seen clearly with our own eyes this morning as we've heard them come forth. We know that your word is able to accomplish the purpose for which it's gone forth. And Father, we ask you this morning to search our hearts. Show us exactly what's in our life today that should not be there. And Lord, help us to be repentant. And Lord, we understand that repentance is an ongoing process. We need to begin to see things as you see things. And as we see them the way that you do, we begin to change our mind towards those things as well. Father, help us to be receptive. Help us to be humble. And help us to always want to please you first and foremost. And Father, we'll be careful to thank you for what you're going to do. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray.